Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. We have a very special guest today, uh, David Morrell, the author of First Blood, which was translated into more than 21 languages, uh, became the uh, top grossing film with uh, more than six sequels. And he's going to talk to us about writing. He loves to talk about movies. And uh, we're very happy to have him here. David Morrell, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. And then for uh, Santa Fe audiences, I've been living here for 29 years. So David, I'm uh, just itching to ask you, um, and forgive me if this is kind of a long question that, uh, did you wanna follow, did you have a follow up, Gary? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So yeah, forgive uh, the length of this question, but uh, Rambo the character, right? He. Uh, He's somebody that's become such a part of the nomenclature that uh, Ronald Reagan said, thanks to the Rambo movies, he'd know what to do if he ever had to go and uh, get hostages. Uh, and there's an expression for people my age, uh, going Rambo, which oh. in this part of the country, they would say, go oh, all yeah. Rambo. And they'd use it, for example, don't just go in there and go all Rambo, bro. You, you, you've you got to be delicate. You've got to sneak in there quietly. Yeah. And, and so that is almost uh, the opposite of who uh, John Rambo actually is. And, and diametrically opposed uh, to this character that wants to be left alone because of all he's been through and represents um, in the story what he represents. So could you tell us a little bit about who the character really is and how that almost became, uh, you know, the opposite became the, uh, the lore? Well, the, the, uh, the novel, we're talking now in the Stone Age here, the, the novel I started in 1968 and that was the year Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Um, there were numerous riots um, related to the war and related to civil rights. And often these are connected because blacks tended not to get the deferments that white did, whites did in terms of going to Vietnam from the draft. And um, I want, I felt that maybe the country was going to have a civil war and I thought it would be interesting to write a novel which tried to give weight to each side. Um, one of our, one of the problems that uh, we have today is, uh, I think that nobody tries to get into the viewpoint of somebody else to see why they would try to understand why they're saying what they are. And that once we understand their motives, maybe we can then in, have a, a dialogue that tries to make sense of everything. Um, and so um, Rambo was um, a decorated special operations soldier who came back from Vietnam hating what had happened to him, hating what it had taught him about himself that, that he in effect had a talent for killing. Um, and the, I then needed another side and, and, and what I tried to invent was a kind of Eisenhower Republican lawman who'd been a war hero in Korea when in a different war, different, different methods and a different time, different attitudes um, and try to, uh, and the novel alternates between the police officer and Rambo and the police officer and Rambo. So we keep seeing them from each other's point of view. And, and Pete readers tell me that I accomplished the task that when they're in, say, the policeman's point of view, Rambo is the bad guy. And when they're in Rambo's point of view, the policeman's the bad guy. So that you cannot, you do not know who to cheer for. Uh, there are no heroes. 
um, they're both antagonists, and that at the end, we would be be aghast at the at what was happening because in a way we're cheering for both of them and and horrified at the same time. So the most famous war veteran in American history is Audie Murphy, uh, who was America's most decorated soldier of World War II, came back to the United States and became a movie actor, and principally in action movies, uh, many of them not great budgeted Universal Pictures, but he did do a few big ones, such as The Undefeated with Burt Lancaster, and I think it's Gene Simmons. Um, and uh, of course, he did The Red Badge of Courage with uh, John Huston. Um, but the, the thing about Murphy is that he wanted to, he had written a book about his experiences called To Hell and Back and played himself in a movie, which has got to be one of those rare things. The person playing himself in a movie. Uh, very meta, uh, and but he he had what we now call PTSD, but there was no name for it. And he had all all he didn't drink, but he gambled. He had nightmares. He had a pistol under his bed. He woke up shooting. Trouble in relationships. He was once arrested for attempted murder for pistol whipping a uh, dog trainer which he said had overcharged a friend of his to train the dog. Uh, he was, he, he wasn't, he was found guilty because he was Audie Murphy. Um, and I thought, uh, one of my, one of my favorite lines in real life is, uh, an assistant director made a, a, one of Audie's female co-stars cry. And Audie went over to the guy and he said, you make her cry again and I'll kill you. And the guy said, you know, looking into those eyes, you believe that given that you've <laughs> already been a charge for attempted murder, you believed he'd do it. Uh, and in the action movies, if you look in his eyes when he's in the shooting sequences, there's something very, very con disturbing going on there. So I thought, all right, Audie Murphy is Rambo. And Audie Murphy will grow a beard and have long hair and look like a hippie. And he will do what many police officers did. In fact, the, the incident in the novel is based upon something that happened in the American Southwest at the time where a band of hippies wound up in a town and the police shaved them and took off their beards and kicked them out of town. And I thought, what would happen if that happened to Audie Murphy? How would Audie react? He, fought for his country and he came back to see what he fought for and this is what happened. So that was that was the gist of it, that Rambo is annoyed uh, and hates himself. And now the first movie made him a victim, uh, a sympathetic victim. The second movie made him a recruiting poster where now suddenly instead of, of hating the war and what it did to him, now he, he was virtually glamorizing it. In fact, and Sly and I talk on occasion about the character. And he told me in a phone conversation some years ago, maybe five, six years ago, that in retrospect, he wished, he thought that the second and third movies glamorized warfare too much and that he wouldn't have done it the same way. And that's it, actually, I can date it. It was 2007 when the fourth film came out because he said he wanted to make a movie that de-glamorized what the second and third movie had, had glamorized. So the, uh, the, the various movies and the, each one tends to have a different version of Rambo um, tended to make him more go Rambo, as you said at the start of this question. Um, whereas in the novel, um, you know, he, he, He's not that kind of character, although it doesn't take much to set him off. Uh, and in the certainly in the movie, he's he's a, he's the reluctant, you know, he's the warrior, he's he's the victim. And it's so, you know, if I were if I were in graduate school and film school, I would do a dissertation on all these movies and the novel and the whole thing against what happened in the '60s to try to understand these movies as a uh, which I had nothing to do with the films um, as um, 
say, reflections of the culture at the time each of them was made. David, I've got to ask, uh, all those years with that uh, series, with the, the First Blood book original, and of course, all the subsequent uh, novels on the subject, uh, what was the relationship with uh, Sylvester Stallone in all those years? Was he, um, I mean, it must have been really interesting, the relationship you had. Well, the first time I met uh, Sly was uh, on a set of one of the Rocky movies. I'm going to guess 1984. Um, and um, we chatted for a bit because he was he was working. Um, but the the what we agreed on was that the way the character it was 86 it would have been after the second movie because that second movie was for that summer the cultural event it's hard to hard to imagine now but it was rambo everywhere in uh, the summer of 1985 and uh we both said this same thing that and i this is still to, to this day i created the character um as sly had in a different way by by writing scripts and co-writing the scripts and and being uh, the actor, that when Rambo was mentioned in the various ways that the character is mentioned, it's almost a litmus test for politics. And I mean, I'm a I'm a registered Democrat, <laughs> so it's very it's very odd, you know, to have some people uh, coming up to me thinking that you know that I'm somebody other than I am, but um, uh, but we both said that in when we see the reference or and it's in, in, in even it's almost every day uh, so much the name is so much in the culture that we were first member of the culture saying oh yeah that Rambo and then clicking to say well wait a minute that's us uh, that we made that happen so it's a very kind of bifurcated thing and you know, I'm, I am a, not only a novelist, but I'm a professor emeritus of American literature and uh, American studies, really. And uh, so this, this whole phenomenon, you know, uh, I, it was uh, Jacques, I believe, who quoted President Reagan, who didn't only quote him once. President Reagan, like, loved to quote Rambo. And in fact, Rambo two and three are basically reflections of Reagan politics. Um, and uh, and um, it's 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 bizarre uh, to have been associated with this, but the uh, at the same time, my analytic, my literary analytic mind, you know, can't help but see this in a in a cultural way, and want and I've written about it many times about how the whole thing changed, and uh, to me, it's just fascinating, and not many, you know. Um, Someone once said, if you if you look at the 20th century, there were five characters from novels who became worldwide phenomenon. Um, Tarzan, uh, or Sherlock Holmes, Tarzan, James Bond, Rambo, and Harry Potter. And, you know, I mean, that's that's a hell of a thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, no one sat down in any of these circumstances knowing how it was going to turn out. Uh, I mean, all of all the novelists involved were surprised uh, but um nonetheless you know it doesn't happen very often it's a it's a cool ride just to you know to be able to watch how all this goes on yeah david when you finish the novel and the novel is a massive success um you know more than uh ever expected and it, it's going to become a movie but that didn't happen right away um, I think it started at Warner Brothers and then um, it took uh, nearly a decade before we actually saw First Blood on the big screen. Are there any stories there? Or oh, any yeah, lots of stories. Um, the first, um, Larry Terman, Lawrence Terman, co-producer co of The Graduate, my agent had submitted it to various studios, because this is what agents do in 1971. Now, this is this is a half century ago. It's just amazing to me to be able to talk about this. And Stanley Kramer stepped up to option it. Um, and 
oh, this is cool. I mean, Stanley was, you know, a first rate producer, serious man, lots of important pictures to his credit. And we waited for the, the contract and we waited for the contract and we waited. And it turned out after six months that he said that he couldn't do it, that he didn't have the financing. So we'd lost six months that we could have been, you know, if this picture wasn't going to happen and there were ads in the New York Times that it was going to happen, you know, soon to be a movie, that kind of thing. Um, and as these things happen, uh, Larry Terman was in a bookstore on uh, Rodeo Drive in uh, Beverly Hills. And he saw the book and it was distinct because there'd never been a hardback with that much action. And uh, he got in touch with my agent and said that he thought that this would be a good thing for Richard Brooks to do. So Brooks writing and directing and Brooks is one of my favorite favorite film people. I mean, in Cold Blood, of course, and Elmer Gantry, but I'm particularly fond of his Westerns, The Professionals and uh, Bite the Bullet. But I mean, you know, this guy was a place. So um, Columbia flew me out to meet with Richard. And we met at his home in Bel Air, a big, big estate. And he had a separate building that was his screening room with an audience, you know, with the theater essentially and an office off of it. And Terman was with me. Uh, I, I, I liked him a lot, but I just call him Terman. And um, Richard um, was wearing the equivalent of a butcher's suit. I, it, was, it was a linen kind of, I can only link, you know, when I've been in butcher shops, that this is what he was. Of course, these days there aren't any butcher shops, so most people wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But they always wore these, 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 these white linen, uh, which I don't know why, because it showed the blood on them. And he said, this is how the movie's going to end. We have Rambo and Teasel and we have all these policemen and we have all the military and they're trying to come to terms with a, what the hell happened here and a shot rings out. And nobody knows where it came from, but all of a sudden everybody's shooting. And Rambo and Teasel are forced to dive into a ditch. And as the bullets kick up, this is painful to describe. As the bullets kick up the dust, Teasel would look at Rambo and say, you know, none of this, this is really painful. None of this would have happened if only we would tried to understand each other. And oh, man. He, oh, man. So we, you know, so there's a long silence and he says, what do you think of that? <laughs> well, it's awful, right? It's just terrible. And I, I said, well, <laughs> I saw a Western the other night, you know, and the Indians were on, forgive me for saying it, but this is, you know, Western and how, and the terms in these movies, they're on one side and the cavalry's on the other side and a shot rings out and the truce is broken and we don't know what happened. And I said, you know, it sort of reminds me of that. And, and I don't know, I mean, it's, it's an idea, but, you know, maybe, maybe we could discuss it a little bit more. And Richard leaned to one side and raised his knee. Now, in impolite circles, he would be about to break wind. But what happened was the phone rang. He had a, as near as I can't prove this, but it was so convenient. I think he had a button under his desk that made the phone ring. So he picked it up and he said, yes, yes. Yes, thank you. And he hung up and he looked at me and he said, my mother-in-law wants me to drive her to the airport. I can't, this is, <laughs> I just have to crack up. My mother-in-law wants me to drive me, drive her to the airport. So the meeting is over and um, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and we were, we were hustled out of there and Terman was driving me and he said, I don't like the feel of this at all. This is not good. This is not good. When you get home, 
when are you getting home? I said, I'll be home at nine o'clock tonight. He said, okay. <clears throat> so sure enough, when I walked into my house, having flown back at that time, I was teaching at the University of Iowa. I arrived literally at nine o'clock. The phone was ringing. So I picked it up and it's Larry Terman. And he said, I talked to, to, to Brooks, boy, he's, he's so upset. He's very, very upset. And he said, I want you to call him. This is his number. I want you to call him. This is unbelievable, right? I want you to call him and you tell him that he's the greatest screenwriter that ever existed. You tell him he's the best director ever. I don't care what you tell him. Just make sure he believes it. So I hung up and I, now remember, I'm phoning Brooks, I'm phoning his home. I dialed, it rang once and Brooks answered the phone. <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, uh, hi, it's David Morell. And he said, who? <laughs> he, I said, you know, I was in my office, your office like six hours ago, you know, we were talking about first. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So what do you want? And I said, well, I just want it. I gather you're a little upset about what I said about this ending you proposed. And I, uh, you know, I really admire your work. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't dishing this on. I was doing it. You know, I said, uh, I've admired your work. And this is the truth since a picture you did, you wrote years ago called Crisis with um, uh, Cary Grant as a doctor in a um, um, Central American uh, crisis ridden um, a, a country. And I said, you know, um, I said, yeah, I, you're a wonderful talent. Uh, what, you know, I have no idea what happened in that conversation and why you're upset, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure you can do make a great movie. And he said, all right, very well. And he hung up. The next day, I got a call from my agent who said, this is very bizarre. He said, I just got a call from the head of Columbia Pictures who said that Richard Brooks was sitting next to him and that I'm supposed to relay a message from Richard through me, through you to David, that the last time he wants to hear from me or and that he'll ever, ever have anything to do with this movie is when he pays his money and gets a ticket and goes in to see the movie. <laughs> so, so that was my introduction to Hollywood. It's a great story. So then Columbia fired Richard and hired, they, they went over to Columbia to uh, Warner's where the more interesting, I mean, you know, I, I, Richard Brooks is great, but how can you turn down Steve McQueen as Rambo? So Steve wanted to do the motorcycle chase. So Steve was cast as Rambo. I know this because Sidney Pollock was the director and he, Sidney told me personally that Steve and he were ready to make the movie in 1975, but, and there's always a but, but Steve was in his mid forties. And after they'd got, they'd signed everybody and they got it all set up. They just remembered that he was in his mid forties. And in 1975, there were no mid forties Vietnam veterans. That was the 18 year old war. So they scrapped it. And then it went through, you know, various iterations, 26 scripts and all told four studios. Yeah, David, um, it's now 1989. It's a Super Bowl. It's uh, Super Bowl 33, as I remember. Uh, it's between the Cincinnati Bengals and the San Francisco team. And, um, you know, there's all these commercials for the first time of a TV miniseries is going to start right after the game, which kind of the first time they did that. Now they do it all the time. They launch a whole new series of television after the Super Bowl. But the, the Brotherhood of the Rose, which was a trilogy you wrote uh, of novels and uh, starring Robert Mitchum, uh, did you watch the football game? Yeah, I I did. Uh, uh, the that, that was a in fact, there's never been a, a, another miniseries after a Super Bowl, Brotherhood of the Rose to this day, 1989. That, it's the only miniseries ever to premiere after a Super Bowl. 
And um, it's important. I think they did a fine job. Uh, 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 Peter Strauss was in it. David Morris, a really nice guy. I, um, and Connie Selica. Um, you know, it's interesting how these things work out. Uh, uh, NBC actually tapped me to be with David for the NBC junket for the the I, I, I've been blessed to be allowed to be part of the publicity for some of these. And um, the, the, the thing that's most memorable to me about the Brotherhood of the Rose is that having become a writer because of my admiration for Sterling Silifant and Route 66, and not long after Route 66, Sterling received an Oscar for adapting John Ball's novel, novel In the Heat of the Night. And then in the 70s, sometimes to his credit, he was the king of disaster movies. He, he wrote The Poseidon Adventure and most importantly in the, the uh, Towering Inferno, which was a masterpiece of construction. I mean, it's not certainly not Shakespeare, but it's a masterpiece of story construction to give all those superstars equal time uh, in, the, in the film. Uh, and Sterling and I communicated back and forth <clears throat> um, I sent him a copy of First Blood and he called me and said, if I were a cat, I'd purr. And um, we visited uh, for the first time, I met him in 1985. Um, I think uh, Sterling was tempted to say, come out and visit on the strength of what happened with Rambo II that summer. But in any case, we became very close and he said, I'm going to go to NBC and suggest they do Brotherhood of the Rose as a miniseries. And so uh, they had so much respect for him. Um, and, and he basically pitched it. He wasn't the agent, but he pitched it. He says, you've never done an action miniseries. They're all romances. So this, especially after the Super Bowl, this would give you a way to slide from that audience from football into an action series. Uh, and NBC said, sure. Um, so uh, Sterling and I worked closely on that. I did four drafts of the miniseries, uh, the script. Um, Sterling then did a draft and then a man named Guy Waldron did a draft. And as happens in the movie business, the last guy usually gets the, the credit. Um, but he and I worked very closely together. And so when I saw the credit executive producer, Sterling Silifant on the Brotherhood of the Rose, that is one of the career highlights for me. I, I thought of Sterling, my father died in combat and the secret to my personality when I was young is that I was looking for reliable father figures. And Sterling often, uh, I didn't see him that often, but for a big chunk of the eighties, he, he was that father figure to me and uh, really a wonderful guy, um, just uh, so charismatic and, and so uh, in some ways my personality and the way I'm talking to you now is a kind of mirror what Sterling was like. And then his, his, he, was, he was held hostage by um, evil Buddhists. And I don't mean that to be a knock against Buddhists, but this was a, he became, he became, um, they controlled him. He was dying from cancer and they controlled him and, and arranged for him to turn over his Writers Guild pension, the largest in Writers Guild history to them. And then they stole his ashes and held them hostage. <laughs> this is all true. They held his ashes hostage for his wife to somehow, I forget what she had to do to get the ashes. I mean, just absolutely insane. But anyhow, Brotherhood of the Rose was, was a big deal for me. And, and uh, the novel too, uh, you know, it was one of the first, maybe the first to combine the strengths of the British and the American spy novel traditions. Until that time, British spy novels were all really, really good spy trade craft, but no action. And American spy novels had crummy, I mean, ridiculous spy craft, but great action. And I mean, action is one of my things. And I thought, well, I can put them together, you know, and, and some very kind people taught me uh, some of the spy stuff that went into the novel. Um, you know, so uh, with the newest Rambo that was uh, released, I believe in uh, 2019, yeah. you uh, actually had disowned the character due to how he was portrayed. So if you could well, tell us a little bit about yeah, that. The problem with that movie <clears throat> is that 
we have a character who in Rambo 2 insists that the mind is the best weapon and that strategy yes he's 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 a warrior but strategy is what wins the war and as a special operations officer said to me after he saw last blood was they turned Rambo into a simpleton I mean, he just simply walks into danger, gets beat up, gets angry, and then wreaks violence um, when it wasn't necessary. If he'd been smart, none of it needed to happen. Um, and um, the, the, I just felt that the character could have been called John Smith, that he was not the Rambo that I recognized. And also, it's interesting to, to look at a 1973, it's hard to see, you, you can only find, Google it uh, on Wikipedia called Track Down. Uh, one of Robert Mitchum's sons is in it. And it's a frank exploitation movie in which a rancher in Montana or the like has his niece held by pornographers in Los Angeles and sets out to do the cowboy thing against the pornographers. It's sort of like a violent version of uh, hardcore. And, um, and you know, the, I, I don't mean to suggest it's a ripoff, but the parallels suggest to me the exploitive nature of, of the most recent film. And I just, I was very unhappy about it. It just, it was not the character as consistent either with the four other movies or with my novel. And there is a way to sort of cram them all together so they're consistent, but the fifth one is not. And, um, oh, I, I, I was gonna ask about gardening. Yeah, please. Do, do you, oh, okay, I was gonna say <laughs> it's uh, St. Patrick's Day just passed. I know it, it, it did snow, but have you planted yeah. your peas? No, 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 I don't. I, I, you know, I, um, the weather here is so strange in Santa Fe that I never know when to trust putting in uh, uh, the, the, the crops. The, the story on that is that when I was a graduate student at Penn State um, and I, I was married, uh, my wife and I have been married 55 years, but I was married you know, we were married then, newly married. We had a very young uh, baby uh, uh, daughter. And uh, by necessity, I had to start thinking about growing food. Uh, and Penn State started as an agricultural college. And at that time, they allowed uh, graduate students to rent at a very reasonable rate, a small plot of land outside town. And so I learned to grow vegetables by necessity, and then it's really cool. I mean, you know, it, it, if you can be in touch with with growing things that way and sort of learn about them and learn from them. Uh, so I've since then that would have been 1967. So I've been, you know, gardening it every year since. I tend to be more interested in vegetables for because I'm programmed that way. Um, and um, the the problem I have with peas is that you don't get a lot of return for the for the care uh, in them. But when I do grow peas, it's the kind that you can eat the pods and all. Uh, and uh, but I, uh, I I'll say last year. With diligence, you can grow vegetables in Santa Fe, but last year was horrid. This the constant oppressive heat. It's the everything went dormant. The, nothing grew. Yeah. They just sort of had got up to my waist and stopped. And um, it's the worst. I have seen progressively more severe summers uh, since I moved here in 92. The 90s were great, but the rains have gradually lessened and the sun, the length of the hot days has increased. And so I have hopes for this year, but I'm thinking maybe I'm going to have to modify them uh, and maybe be a little more modest about what I hope to achieve. Plus, I've got four deer living on my property. It's, it's not a large property, but they wander from, from house to house and they, they ate all my tomatoes one year. So I had to move the, the plot to get away from them. It's, it's a curse. You just gotta, you gotta be fighting against nature all the time. 
You do I'm glad that to hear I'm not the only one with the bad uh, the summer last year. Sorry, oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, enough that you need shields, maybe, you know, uh, like in The Godfather at the end <laughs> with uh, Over the Tomatoes. <laughs> Gary, what were you going to say? You know, your book, The Successful Novelist, is a bestseller. It, uh, a lot about writing. And uh, I just wondered if, uh, if you had, uh, I, I know you have the, uh, the successful novelist was a big seller for you, but I, I'm really curious, what are the basics of writing fiction, David? Well, um, I think some people are hardwired to do it. I, I was, um, I remember I was speaking uh, to a writer's group once and a, and a gentleman had brought his 17 year old daughter who wanted to be a writer. And uh, he listened to me. And one of the things I talk about that one of the differences between maybe a fiction writer and somebody else is that fiction writers are in, intensely aware of their daydreams. They are, those are spontaneous uh, eruptions from our subconscious. And most of my stories have come from uh, daydreams where I said, gee, that's, that's interesting. And where did it come from? Uh, and as I, I write a letter to myself in which I try to analyze the idea and decide if it's worth a year writing and, and uh, where it might take me and what have you. <clears throat> and uh, I, when I was done with this, the father came out with his uh, somewhat embarrassed daughter, you know, because what he said to me, what's this daydreams? What are you talking about? And I get that. You know, creative people tend to take daydreams for granted, but I assure you, in parts of this great country, if you started talking that way, they would not know what you are talking about. That, uh, that it's either shut down or it's incapable of occurring. Um, so that uh, in, in a way you have to be hard, hard, I don't mean this exactly critically because they're different people are different ways. But if you want to be a writer, a novelist, it helps if you have rich daydreams. Uh, and you know, as I said, most of my stories come from that. Um, and Graham Greene once said that uh, an unhappy childhood is a gold mine for a writer. And uh, I, I had a terrible upbringing. My father died in combat. My mother had to put me in an orphanage. And when she remarried, they didn't get along. And I slept under the bed because I was afraid. And um, it made me a storyteller. I had plenty to write about. Hemingway once said to somebody, he said, I want to be a writer. And he said, oh, okay, have you ever been in war? No, and he, he, nothing had happened to this guy. And he said, so, all right, I want you to go hang yourself <laughs> and have somebody right there to cut you down just before you're dead. So then you'll have something to write about. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with, uh, I, I'm not sure a happy person can write fiction. Um, uh, among other things, because of the conflict that's inherent in, in a story. Uh, and uh, so basically, um, I, um, went in my own uh, methods, I uh, write this letter to myself to see if this, if, this, if this incident has implications that I can investigate and what kind of character would I have and what would the theme be and I go forward. Um, over the years, I have taught writing a great deal at various conferences, and I've come in my maturity. I've come to the conclusion that the problem is related to confused thinking. That if, and I usually start this way, if you want to be rich and famous, don't try to be a writer because you're already imitating. And imitation, nobody wants to read an imitation of our favorite writer. They want the real thing. And the imitation is usually not very good. And so I, I, I finally got two homilies, if you like, uh, that I repeat often. One is be a first-rate version of yourself and not a second-rate version of another writer. And the second is don't chase the market. You'll always see its backside. You know, you spend a year writing a book to imitate what's the current market and the market moves on. You're always behind it. Um, so I found these personally to be 
uh, helpful to be be directions. And and in life, it's a pretty good thing to try to be a first rate version of yourself too. Uh, and I. I found that if somebody's goal is to be rich and famous, which these days is highly unlikely now that the print, now that novels and books have become so, um, it's a whole other subject, but the market isn't there, the, the variety isn't there. On the bestseller list, you have <clears throat> brand, excuse me, you have brand names, um, you have social conscious um, uh, novels, and you have uh, novels that feature either women uh, or, or are by women writers. Uh, it's just the way it is on the list. And many uh, male authors have found that they are unable to place books because they don't have a female character, uh, a dominant female character, which, you know, it's just the way the market goes. But if you're, you'll go crazy if you try to imitate the models that I just told you, the only thing you can do is write the book that you personally feel you can't live without writing. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, Dan, Before, we better leave it right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Where, God, I, I can't wait to have you back on to talk more. Um, what a fun episode this has been. Uh, this was Film Talk Weekly with award-winning author David Morrell. We'll see you next week. Thank you.